I love the Bible. It is God's word. Uh, somebody asked me on a panel discussion that I was having at a conference. They said, um, they asked the panel, what's your favorite uh, story in the Bible about who? And I thought to myself, there are many stories in the Bible, and it is very difficult to always pick because it depends on what you're going through, right? A, a certain story might be your favorite at the time. You know, when you're going through hardship, Job, Job becomes <laughs> like... You know, you just you just got sick for two days and you think you Job. You like if Job could go through, you ain't been you ain't even been close. You ain't never met a human who even came quarter close to what Job went through, right? Or if you are if you got something going on in your life, you know, you, you got family problems, you start Joseph, his brothers beat him up. So right now my family members ain't talking to me because um, but if Joseph could bear it. Y'all ain't working with me today. Amen. Some people lie about you. You feel like, Daniel, I'm in the lion's den. They all lie. <laughs> Shut the mouth of the lions, God. Come on, somebody. You broke. You, you know how you're going to pay the bill. You feel like Moses, Lord, part the Red Sea. Part the Red Sea. Come on, somebody. It's very hard to pick a favorite part of the Bible because what I realize about the Bible is that the Bible is... It's many stories of people's lives, but it's really one story about a God who loves his people. And uh, it's, it's a story about this awesome God that we serve that not only loves his people, but it is his primary way of communicating to us. Somebody asked me on that same panel, they said, hey, pastor, how do you know when God is speaking to you? How, tell us when God speaks to you, what that's like. I said, very simple, the Bible. And they were disappointed. They were like, oh, God. Like, he don't shout to you in the mall. He don't give you a feeling. Might be, might, might be, but my feelings could feel any kind of way any, on any day. Amen. My feelings might make me want to, you know what I'm saying? Run up on somebody for, the, for Jesus. Amen. My feelings could lead me all types. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or do you always feel on cloud nine? Amen. Amen. And so when I said that, you know, people, people always want to get so high and spiritual and get all these revelations. But I tell them that if the revelations don't line up with the word, it ain't it's 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 a revel lie. <laughs> don't be mad at me because you got a revelation. People, people hear God all types of weird ways. God, if it's you, the next three exit signs, let it read something. And I'm going to believe that's. Bro, you bugging, bro. That's going to say exit. That means die. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And even, <laughs> I am on fire today. All right. But the point I'm trying to make is that not only is the Bible the story of God's love for his people, it is God's primary way of talking to us. He, he constantly wants to speak to your situation. And so the man who is constantly in the word of God will constantly be in communion with God. That was good. Write that down for me so I can remember and tell myself later. The man who is constantly uh, uh, feeding. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and in context you can see what he meant because every time the enemy tempted him he quoted the, the Bible the enemy quoted something and he misused it and God quoted it back rightly yeah, there's a lot of people that don't know the Bible like they know parts of it they know a, a, a scripture here a scripture there a scripture everywhere Amen. <laughs> but you got to know the thing. And God communicates to his people through his word. And he does that. I heard a, a, a preacher once say, the Bible is not about you. David is not about you. So when you hear the story of it, and I understand what he meant, because sometimes, you know, we, but the truth is, I believe God wrote these stories because we can relate to these people. So, 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 so on one end, I understand that I'm not David, but on, on, on the other end, I understand that God is using David's life to speak to me when I walk through giant experiences. 
Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I, I, that's why, I, even though I joked about it, when you go to the hospital and they tell you something bad and they tell you something that, 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 that you, you throws you off, you, you can relate to the woman with the issue of blood. When, 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 when stuff is dead in your life and it feels like I need this to come back to life, you, you can relate to what Mary and Martha felt when Lazarus was dead. But then you could also see a Jesus come and call it back to life. So, so I know the Bible isn't about me, but it is God speaking to me in my situations using people that are just like me, their lives. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Amen. Hallelujah. And so one of the persons that speaks to me a lot is my brother, my big brother, David. I like David. Through David life, God speaks to us so much. God speaks to us on how to worship through David. David was a worshiper. David was a skilled musician who played his harp. David worshiped anywhere, anytime. He gave us the book of Psalms, some of the greatest passage of scriptures we have ever read. Even those that don't go to church and follow him, they open it to the book of Psalms and leave it in their house. Because they just believe this. Permeate the air. But he was a worshiper. David was the one that says, the Lord is my shepherd. Come on, somebody. In case you didn't know, we sang a song today that says, Jaira, you are enough. Come on, man. We all be trying to sing like homeboy got that voice, man. Homeboy got that, I will be dry. My voice all skinny. I don't sound like him, you know what I'm saying? I don't know why I do this, man. <laughs> if you know, you know. You don't know, you're like, what is he talking about? But we sang that song, Jaira, you are enough. But thousands of years ago, there was another singer who already said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. He was saying, Jaira, you are enough before you had the record. He taught us how to worship. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no. He was somebody who said, cast me not away from your presence. And, and I could go, the Lord is my light. And I could go on and on and quote it. And he taught us how to worship. He taught us, he taught us how to worship. David taught us how to deal with when people Think you're insignificant or might count you out. The Bible says that when his father was told that there's a king in your house, gather your whole family together and sanctify them. Sanctify was a cleansing ritual that you had to be cleansed, washed. And so in that, God said, I'm going to choose a king, sanctify them. The father sanctified all but one. And he was out in the field. And the king tried, the, the prophet tried to anoint somebody. And the first one got up and he looked good. And he looked like a king. But how many of you know that king is not a look. King is a call. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Y'all better put on that AC in here too. Because Jaira, I need you. Hallelujah to be enough. Hallelujah. Amen. A, 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 a king is a calling. And so all these brothers are being one by one standing up and God rejected them all. And then the king said, do you got another son? He said, yeah, I got one, but he's in the field. I could never understand Jesse because if my kid is, if they told me my kid is going to be the president, I'm, I'm getting your kids in case one of them disqualified. I'm bringing the whole hood in there and be like, yeah, he mine too. Yeah, he mine. He, this man forgot one of his sons. And the Bible says that they said, we won't stand, we won't sit until he gets here. 
And when he walked in, notice that they had to be sanctified. He wasn't sanctified. David was showing us what true sanctification is before we even learn what it was. He was sanctified because he was already pure in heart. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me in this house. He taught us how to deal with it because I've never once read a scripture anywhere where you see David was big mad at Jesse. He never held a grudge against his father in that moment. Something about this boy, he, he, the Bible said that, that God used him, hallelujah, to fight giants. He showed us how to deal with giants. He showed us when things come up in our lives, how we deal with them. The Bible says he showed up to the battlefield carrying some cheese for his brother. I don't understand that. Showed up to the battle and when he showed up, he saw the children of Israel cowering. And as they were cowering, he said, why, why, why are the people of God looking like this? Why are they depressing? Somebody said there's a giant that comes out here every day that screams and shouts and, and pumps fear in the people of God's heart. How many of you know that we still face giants that try to do that to the body of Christ? There's things, there's voices in the world, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, and if we're not careful, we can cower because of these voices. But David showed us, David showed up and said, what? I'll fight him, hallelujah. David not only showed us how to deal with a giant, he showed us how to fight. He showed us that you can't fight with nobody else's anointing. You can't fight with nobody else's strength. Because Saul of a sudden saw there was a young man that would fight a battle that he wouldn't. He said, at least take my armor. David said, man, pardon me, but I can't fight with your armor. I got to fight the way God called me to fight. He showed us how to fight. He was teaching us how to be us in God. That's very important to somebody like me. Years ago, I tried, tried to robe. I tried, I, well, I ain't really put it on, but I, I, I thought about it. But it wasn't me. I had to be me if God was going to use me. Let me tell you something. When God made you, it wasn't an accident. Your personality and who you are is who you are. How you look is how God is going to use you. Stop fighting who you are and just submit who you are to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and he showed us, he said, I can't. And then when he finally faced the giant, the whole world watching at the time, the whole nation watching, he come out with some rocks. You know how bugged I'd have been back there? If I was a warrior, I'd be like, man, this king bugging. We're going to vote him out. His, he got to go. The whole, his whole team got to go because they sent a boy to fight this man. And it, what he, what, what, he got rocks in a sling? This is insulting. And David is over there that even the giant himself said, this is y'all insulting me. Boy, I'm going to cut you up and feed you to the dog. Today you done. And David over there still holding on to his Lord, showing us that in the middle of the scariest battle, when all eyes is on you and you don't know what tomorrow holds, he said, man, you came to fight with your sword and spear. But I fight in the name of the Lord. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would ever defy God's people? He taught us that when it's time to fight, you fight in the name of the Lord. Taught us how to do this. David taught us how when you are called to a position and somebody's trying to fight you and defeat you. And when those who are called to mentor you actually see you as a threat. Because believe it or not, Saul was supposed to be a good mentor to a David. But instead he got jealous of David and the same person that was worshiping and lifting demons and devils off of him, he was hurling javelins at. And when people are mean to you and treat you bad, people who are supposed to love you and care for you and mentor you, all of a sudden mistreat you and abuse you, he showed you how to handle that. He said, I will never touch God's anointing. God's job if he wants to move them, not mine. And that's a lesson we could all learn because some of us, we soon as we learn, no, 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 don't give me that scripture, I'm God's anointed too, so I can touch you and I can chop him. <laughs> it is not my job to move anything that God placed there. That's God's job. It is not God. He showed us how to get a position. He said you don't got to fight for it. If it's God's will for you to get it, just be you. It'll open. 
Come on, God talk. God is talking all through this boy, man. Every And so, because I learned this from David, anything you got to fight to get, you're going to have to fight to keep. And believe it or not, when David got it, a lot of people try to take it. But God, you, you read his story, man. God was just fighting his battles for him, defeating his enemies everywhere he went. He was blessed because he was called. And when Saul was trying to kill him, he was still serving him faithfully. Cut his robe and said, I could kill you, man. I ain't trying to kill you, man. I'm trying to serve you. But here's the thing about David that I learned that even though the people who are supposed to mentor you don't do it lovingly, whatever means they choose to, God will still use them to mentor you. Because it was through all of that that David found himself meeting people who were vagabonds that nobody, he met all, David had warriors that were so bugged. Dudes was like, there's a lion, let me, let me handle him. Like who hangs with those type of people? These were the people that David ran with. And he learned, he learned the art of warring. He learned what it meant to lead people. He learned what it meant to deal with people. And God even used his son Jonathan in the process. God was speaking all through this boy to us. So one of the scriptures I want to read about David's life today. Y'all still with me? Is in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 26 to 27. And this is what it says. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. She cried for her husband. Go on. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. How does a man that I just described for the last 20 minutes end up here? This makes me want to check myself before I riggedy. If he can fall if I'm not careful I can do a lot of great things and still end up in a crazy place the title of my sermon today is the drift, the drift, the drift, the drift. How do men that once were so in love and following God end up in a place where they have drifted? Let us pray today. Father, I bless you today. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts. That you would talk to us today. That you would, God, Lord Jesus, cause us to be drawn closer to you. Not only do David speak about all these things, but his life was used to speak on how to handle drift. On how to handle those times in our lives when we are slipping from you. And I pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of First Samuel, I mean Second Samuel chapter 11 verse 1, if you would put that up for me, amen. This is what it says. This is what the story says. It begins with telling you, Amen. 
that David was living in a time when the men, uh, 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 look at what it says. It says, in the spring at the time when kings do what? When they're supposed to be doing what? Going to war, to battle. David sent Joab out with the king. Whoa, whoa. Who's supposed to be with the king's men? Instead, he said, he said, I'm going to send somebody else to be in my place. He takes himself out of the place he's supposed to be. He sends Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. Wait a minute. An army is supposed to be there to protect who? So if I'm sending the army away, I am making myself now a sitting target. And there's something that the Bible is showing you here militarily that's about to happen spiritually in his life. When you move out of the army and the places that God has put up for you to be in protection, you become an isolated sitting target for the devil. You can't tell me being around God's people and being in his presence and being in a line with his will is not important. The minute you pull yourself out of the guardrails that God has set up for the believer, you become a sitting target. Be careful that you don't tell yourself, I can do Christianity on my own. And I can make it up as I go along. I don't need pastors and elders. And I don't need church. And I don't need a body of believers around me. Be careful that you are somebody who says, I don't really need to do all the things that the pastors have told me all these years. And you begin to pull yourself out of what God has set up to keep you safe. And instead of him going to war with the rest of them, the Bible says that he sent the whole army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. And David did what? Remained in Jerusalem. And when you ain't busy with what God has called you to, the devil got something for you to do. Idle hands make the devil play wrong or workshop or something, something. I don't know the quotes about the devil. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That's why the Bible talks about the believer being occupied until he comes. You got to fill yourself with stuff to do or else the enemy going to fill your agenda. Come on, somebody. God didn't call us to do nothing. My mother said the lazy river was so lazy that when it was time to get out, she didn't want to get out. I, in my mind, I was thinking, was it the lazy river or mom? <laughs> <laughs> or you was just enjoying it a little too much. Sometimes life can be like a lazy river and make you want to do nothing and sit there. And you sit there long enough, that water going to kill you. And instead of David pursuing God's call on his life. He want to chill and take a break. I want you to know you don't take a break from Christianity. We live in an era where people take a break. It's my birthday weekend. What you doing? I got to turn up this weekend. It's my birthday. It's only once. Instead of you giving God praise, you saw another year you in a club. I got quiet. It's my birthday. I got to drink a little bit this week. You, bro, he pulled you out of that. How dare you go celebrate with what he pulled you out of? You don't take a break from Christianity. You know how many times I felt like doing that? You don't get it. When people cut you off on the road, a lot of times I'll be tempted, God, give me two minutes. I'll be back in the kingdom. I just got to let them know. My daughter be in the back, road rage, road rage. I'm like, shut up. Well, I'll take it out on you. Road rage, road rage. You're raging, Dad. I know. No, 
know how many times you want to take a break? Well, let me go on Instagram today. Let me see. You know, there's something they talk about in pop culture. Let me just see what this celebrity is. And you start taking a break from kingdom through your eyes. What am I doing? Why y'all laughing? I'm just cleaning my finger. (laughs) 30 minutes later. Then you walk out feeling all kinds of ways. If you were lusting, now you're walking around lusting all day. Can't keep your head above water and make the waves when you can. I be trying, man. They don't, they don't get my jokes. You see me, right? Y'all get it, though. Keep your head above water. You start lusting all day. Or if you were comparing yourself to somebody, you walk around depressed all day. It's so funny to me. You could never really satisfy men. Men are walking around with phones that are $1,000. How many of you got an iPhone or a Galaxy? Raise your hands. A brand new iPhone or or an iPhone 13, 14, 12. Raise your hands. Come on. come, Man, there's some liars up in here. Y'all ain't got no flip phone or star tackle rolling around. Y'all just be lying. Y'all like, I know pastor going to make a point. I ain't going to help him. I ain't going to help him. If you got a galaxy within the last three years, raise your hand. You got a, 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 put your hands up, people. They like this. You got, that's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. If I continue down this strength, we got about $60,000 in phones alone in this room. If y'all sell it, you'd save yourself a lot of headache. That's number one. And we, we on our way to get in the building. That was the point. That was the point. Here's the point I'm really trying to make. We got $1,000 phones. We got $200 sneakers. We got jeans that are $100. We got cars that are... And we walk around like, what's the meaning of my life? I don't know what I want to do. I'm just looking for adventure. There is a crook right now looking at your sneakers, and he's going to have some adventure in a minute. There's a poor kid somewhere... Hungry for what you, we are living in the most blessed time. We, our problem in America is inflation. Why? Because they give you the money. Yeah. This government, crazy. they keep giving money out to fix it. I just don't get it. I, everything I learned in school does no longer applies. Right. Pronouns don't work no more. <laughs> I am, uh, yeah, yeah, what, what's up? What's good? At least give me back my grade for when I failed now, teacher. Find my English teacher. I'd be like, you was wrong. I am they. (laughs) According to Sevi, his pronouns are get and money. (laughs) And my pronouns is right behind him, me and two. Oh, come on, somebody. They give you the money. You getting money to fix inflation. We going to give you, and we got a bunch of money. I don't know what to do. And we're depressed. You don't have purpose if you're not connected to the purpose giver. And the minute you take a break from kingdom, the drift. Oh, the drift starts to happen. Be careful who you're hanging out with because who you are in relationship with is going to influence you. Be careful what you hang out with because some people don't hang out with people. They hang out with stuff now. (laughs) What you are in relationship with is influencing you. 
and the drift happens slickly and slowly in your life. As simple as this man, and for time's sake, you could read the story. The Bible says in the next verse, put it up, that he went on top of his roof. They at war, and he is on the hanging out on the roof. What you doing on the roof? Spying. His men oh, getting stabbed up on the field. And he on the roof. <laughs> they have a song named Peepin, right? <laughs> I am not stupid. No, <laughs> I know. The Bible says he's on the roof. David got up from his bed. And so did the bed there. On the roof. David got up from his bed and walked. <laughs> And walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman. King, come on, man. Go back downstairs, bro. <laughs> the woman was very. And that's how the drift starts. First, you disconnect slowly. And then when you disconnect, it is a simple distraction. This distraction led from a look to adultery. I got some quick points for you. Number one, listen to this. The drift. Consistency, you hear me say this before, picks up where motivation drops off. The reason why some of us... A loud drift that happens because motivation goes. When you come to church and you hear a message, you're excited. By Tuesday, you're done. Tuesday. Tuesday, this message, we're off. By, not even by tonight. <laughs> by 3 o'clock, when y'all leave the buffet. <laughs> this message, we're off. And when motivation dies, consistency picks up. Well, what is consistency? The developing of habits. Things that I'm going to do, whether I'm motivated or not. You say, I don't know how to do that. You do it. You go to work every day. Everybody in this room, don't wake up dumb excited about going to work. You don't wake up like, yes, <laughs> getting on the train. Woo! <laughs> New York Transit. Yeah! You get up like, but you are consistent because here's the second thing. What anchors consistency is love. You say, what do you mean by that? I don't always want to do the things I do, but I do it because if I don't go to work, if I don't do what I'm supposed to, the children that are depending on me to feed them will go hungry. So my love for something else makes me develop habits to take care of them. Those habits become my consistency so that when motivation is not there, I'm still going to do it because I love her. And so this tells me that if I'm going to truly serve the Lord, I got to watch and make sure that my affections are always for the Lord. Because the minute that love dies, which it does in some marriages, the minute that that starts to go chaotic, I might not want to be consistent over here because I don't see the need to be with you. I'm out and moving to, to Kentucky. And so when you nurture your relationship with God and you keep that love flowing, hallelujah, it keeps you consistent. It makes you develop habits and in turn, it causes you to be in a good place with God. Amen. This man went from drifting to now deceiving himself because he called a woman to his house. He slept with her. And then the Bible says, he sent her home. He thinks, that's it. But how many of you know, be careful because your sin will find you out. The worst news he got was a message that was sent to him that says, 
I am pregnant. And so David said, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to hide it. Deceit. He started trying to lie now. And I want you to listen to this, y'all. You are not what you display only. You are also what you're hiding. <laughs> it would be getting so quiet in here. People be like, I don't know whether to amen or not. <laughs> that one hurts. You are not what you display. You are also what you hide in. You are not. When you talk and got everybody fooled, oh, he's so lovable. If you a gossiper behind closed doors, you, you might not be so. It's going to come out. Somebody going to hear what you said about them. Whenever you gossip, know the person going to eventually hear. So just don't say nothing. Amen. Amen. You are not what you display. You are also what you hide. And he deceived himself. Look at what the book of Galatians 6, 7 says. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever one sows, he will also reap. Y'all with me today? Amen. So, 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 so then after that, when the baby, the baby was on the way, he said, Uriah, bring Uriah in. He said, Uriah, I called you home from battle just to spend some time with your wife. Go home and enjoy your wife. He's hoping that Uriah, the Hittite, goes home, has fun. Baby comes out. He's like, yeah, here, Uriah, you got a beautiful son. <laughs> you see how buck that? This is the man that slew the, the giant. This, Christian people can be conniving. He said, go home. The man says to him, nah, I, I, ain't, I can't do that, king. I, I, I. I'm here to serve you. He says, all right, let's, let's bring him to dinner. He said, you like Bacardi? <laughs> here you go, Uriah. I'm going to buy you a drink. <laughs> Blame it on the... I, I, I. I'm all secular today. Yeah. He said, let's, let's get him drunk. Uriah's drunk. He said, are you going to go home now? He drunk. David, get up. See the man drunk laid out in front of the palace. Why you ain't go home? He said, I can't go home. I told you. I can't do this when the ark of God is not resting here. And you who are the, the light of Jerusalem, the light of Judah. He is reminding David who he is. He said, do you know who you are? I'm serving you this because of all you've ever displayed. He's a Hittite. Which means he came from foreign lands and his whole family converted their traditions to Judaism. To follow this David. He was Faithful, and he's reminding him, you crazy, I would never go because you are. Be careful that you don't glorify people too much. And when you are a leader, know that your life matters to people. Know that what you, oh gosh, don't you ever think this is just my life and I'm going to do what I, that's the selfish thing that America tells you. Your life has impact on people. People that are watching you. So the Bible says all things might be permissible, but they're not beneficial. And if something causes a brother to stumble, don't do it. While others may, you can't. It's funny because as a pastor, that's what people do. Pastor, you know you can't do that. You can't either. Whatever I can't do, you can't do. If y'all don't want me to come up here with a bottle of Bacardi, I shouldn't see you with it. If I shouldn't come up here and, and get, oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. If I can't come up here and quote some lyrics. With so much drama in the LBC. It's kind of hard being, oh, don't sound right in church, right?
If I can't do it on this pulpit, what makes you think it's good in yours? Deception. And the craziest thing is when you deceive yourself. And you see this because when the prophet came to David, David said, show me the man who did this. Show me the man. I'm going to destroy him. We demand from other people what we don't do ourselves. They ain't going to tell me nothing today, you know. They ain't going to tell... I'm almost done, y'all. I promise you I'm done. Because it's hot. Then he had a decision. At this point, when the man said, you are the light of Judah, bro. You, you, the ark, you, you are King David. He could have said, I repent. So you got the drift. You got the deceit. And now you got the decision. The drift, the deceit, and the decision. When he's told what's happening, the Bible says that he chooses to kill the man. Look at the, pro look at the progression, y'all. I'm going to stay home today. I ain't going to pray with y'all today. I'm going to, probably not going to read to them a little busy. I'm going to go take a nap. Oh, I can't sleep. Let me go on the roof. And one look led this great king to now being an adulterer. And now he has a decision to make. And now the reason why David's family will never know peace is because of the decision he's about to make. And Nathan says, because you've done this, the sword will always be in your house. And from the time on, you saw Absa, you saw uh, uh, his son, Am Amnon, rape Tamar. And you saw Absalom big mad. And David couldn't tell him nothing about the rape he did because... He did the same thing to a woman who was taking a bath. And he's silent in his own house. And Absalom kills his brother and starts to turn the heart of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that it shook the throne of David. And he just was walking. People were walking. Shimei comes out and thrown rocks at David. Thrown rocks at him and said, look at you. People start coming out and just making ridicule him. Absalom takes his wife at the council of Ahithophel and takes his wives, his concubines, and in front of the nation opens up and performs sexual acts with all of them in front of the nation. What you did in private is on display in your house. That decision... After the drift is important, the decision, listen to this, can send you further down the path you're on or it could turn you around. Deuteronomy 30, 30, 19 says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that your children may live. And this man chooses to kill Uriah. And he calls Uriah. And now after the decision, you get the defeat. He kills Uriah. The prophet comes, told him he sinned. And his whole world is rocked. But in every defeat... You also learn the lesson how to win a victory. Whenever we look back at defeats or failures in life from other people. It is in those moments you can see why they failed. 
And I started out my message by telling you God speaks to us through these people's lives. And in his defeat, we can learn a lesson how to get victory all the time. How? From the minute you see the drift come and shut it down. And why that's important, because the drift might not come in a form of lust. It might come in the form of bad news, and you want to curse God. It might come in the form of financial hardship, and you feel God is unfair because you're not connected. It could come in so many forms. I want you to know that the storms are fighting to take your eyes off Jesus. But in the middle of the storm, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, you'll rise above the waves. You'll walk on water. The storms are trying to distract you. God is allowing the storms to show you that he's greater than the storms. But you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Tell your neighbor, keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus and God still says David is a man after my own heart and God still look look at the God oh I don't know nobody else if this was your pastor his church would be empty he'd be on tiktok every week he he he, he'd be on social media if this if this was a man alive today he'd be the most ridiculed man yet this man was the man from who jesus lineage was coming and not only that but the lady is mentioned in the lord's lineage that's the kind of god we serve that and here was the secret to David. Once he was shown where he went wrong, you never saw that same mistake twice. Some of us got to make it again and again and again. And we swimming in it like a lazy river before we can get out of it. But he was a man after God's own heart. Because once he saw it displeased God, you didn't have to tell David. That's why you get scriptures like, cast me not away from your presence. I've sinned. And when he found out he sinned, he said, God, I've sinned against you and you alone. And he wept and he repented. And God still used his life. God can still use yours, but listen to me. Why have a repaired name than just a good name? And I close with this. Even though God blessed him and used him, somebody said it, the consequences remained. If you sleep around and you get AIDS, God will forgive you. You'll go to heaven, but you still got AIDS. You rob somebody at gunpoint and you did whatever, you, God going to forgive you. You're going to go to heaven, but you're going to jail. People come to me all the time, Pastor, pray for my son. He got a trial. Okay, what's going on? They wrongfully accused him. Nah, he had a gun. A little, uh, homie, he going to jail. <laughs> You asking me to pray for a man who's carrying an illegal gun? Would you, Lord, bless him in the gun? <laughs> he can be forgiven, but he's going to jail. David was forgiven, but the consequences came. Man, I don't want that for me, and I don't want that for you. Watch out for the drift. I'm done, y'all. I'm done. <laughs> Bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm getting ready to pray with you. My guy Isaac and me were on the boat when we were shooting the video for vacancy. So, life with Isaac, the adventures I have, hallelujah. The two of us are hilarious together. We should get us. So anyway, I'm on the boat. We fly the drone up in the air. The drone is in the air. And the two of us 
Nobody's manning the boat. We just put the boat in neutral and we left it. You could tell I don't know nothing about no boat. And I'm like, okay, seem to be staying still here. And I'm not noticing 